Hey everyone, in this video, I attempt to answer the question, what is actually the best sugarcane farm in Minecraft? So I decided to simulate the most popular farm designs in the programming language Python and find out. I programmed six different sugarcane farms and layouts, so for the sake of time, I can't walk you through the code for each one. Instead, I'm going to cover the general steps that all the programs take to simulate growing and harvesting sugarcane. Up on the screen, I've put a simple roadmap of how I structured each program. Now, before I typed out any code, I actually did write flowcharts and decision trees and lists to understand what I need to code and how the code should flow. And this roadmap is just a nicer, cleaner looking version of those scribbles, so hopefully it's easier to follow this way. Let's start at the beginning. The first thing we need to do is understand how the game runs and updates. Every world generated in Minecraft is broken up into chunks. These are 16 by 16 areas that stretch from the very top of the world to the very bottom. And in very simple terms, breaking up the game like this helps it run better. Chunks are then further broken down into subchunks, which are 16 tall sections like this. So one subchunk is 4,096 blocks in volume. And in my code, I represent this with an array or a list of coordinates. So the bottom left is 0, 0, 0, and the top right is 15, 15, 15. And that's just a very intuitive way for me to think about it. So I have a list of 4,096 coordinates that I can then store data in. For example, whether or not Shurikane is actually at that spot. Next, Minecraft runs on an internal clock that governs just about every function in the game in a very consistent, predictable way. Things like the weather, the day-night cycle, and even redstone circuits follow this clock strictly. We call this heartbeat of the game, game ticks, of which there are 20 game ticks in a single second. All that saying is Minecraft worlds update 20 times per second. Now, to add an element of randomness to the game, Minecraft has what we call random ticks. And for each game tick, three random ticks are generated in every subchunk. These random ticks control a lot of crops like wheat, kelp, and important to this video, sugarcane. How does this work though? Well, if we zoom back out here and take a look at this one subchunk right here, let's say we progress the game one game tick. Each block in this subchunk then has a three out of 4,096 chance to receive a random tick, right? Because there are three random ticks per game tick. So we could have something that looks like this, where each red block is a block that got a random tick. To simulate this in my code, I simply generate a random number between 1 and 4096 three times per game tick. Then I can match that number to a coordinate in the list I mentioned earlier and then do stuff with that block if needed. Now that we know how random ticks are generated, let's move on to our next stop. Sugarcane has five key mechanics that we need to consider if we want to actually simulate it accurately. The first is its grow layout. Simply put, sugarcane needs to be placed directly next to water, could be a source block waterlogged block, or even flowing water like these, but it can't be placed diagonally. As a side note, you can plant sugarcane on any of these blocks here, and there is no difference in the rates or efficiencies of sugarcane actually growing. The next mechanic is its age. Sugarcane ages from zero to a max of 15, and unlike kelp, sugarcane always starts at age zero when planted. And I've already done a video where I programmed a clock-based kelp farm to find its best timings, so you can check that out up here if you're interested. Next, we have what I call stages. When farming, there are three possible stages. Stage one is the base sugarcane layer that is planted. Stage two is the middle layer, and stage three is the highest layer. Upon world generation, it is possible for sugarcane to be four stages tall, but this doesn't happen when farming, so we don't need to worry about it. The next mechanic is how sugarcane grows. When a block of sugarcane receives one random tick, it increases its age by one. It'll keep doing this until it reaches age 15, and then it's ready to grow. So once it receives that 16th tick, it'll check for two things. One, is there a block above? And two, is it at stage three? If either of those are true, it won't grow. For the code, we now have a few conditions or if statements that we need to implement when growing. We also know that it takes 16 random ticks for a sugarcane block to grow, which takes roughly 18.2 minutes. And the math for that is on the screen if anyone is interested. So for example, if we wait, let's say 36 minutes to harvest, we're only gonna grow one sugarcane on average. But if we waited 36 and a half minutes to harvest, we would have gotten an extra sugarcane. And again, this is on average. This fact leads to a lot of inefficiencies and we'll see this later on. The last mechanic to check is what happens when we harvest sugarcane. Once a sugarcane block is broken, the age of the block below resets to zero and the cycle repeats. That was a lot, but now we have an understanding of how the game updates and how sugarcane works. The next thing I did in my code was define a bunch of variables that I wanted to track when simulating the farms. 
This brings up the question, what actually makes a farm the best? So I came up with three objective metrics that we can compare easily. The first is efficiency. The second is the farm output. And to make it consistent across designs, I'm measuring this in sugarcane harvested per hour per sugarcane planted. And third is compactness, or the volume required per sugarcane planted. This one isn't as important, I think, but I figured if all else is equal, a compact design is slightly better. There can also be some subjective metrics, like ease of building and resource cost. So I'll discuss these as we look at each farm, but really the best farm can vary based on each player and their goals when building these. Because ultimately, even if a farm is ultra efficient or gets the most drops, if it's costly or too difficult to build, it might not be the best farm for that player. So far, we've done a lot of prep work. Now it's time to actually look at the farms. The first two farms here are nearly identical. The only difference is in the layout of the sugarcane. The farm on the left uses simple rows of sugarcane and water, whereas the farm on the right is, according to the wiki, the most area efficient layout. On the code side of things, in all, I simulated each farm for a thousand hours, and for the clock based farms, I tested harvest intervals from roughly a minute to 120 minutes. So we should have a lot of data. With the prep code out of the way, all that's left to do is quote unquote, run the game. This is when we'll grow and harvest the sugarcane in our program. Because game ticks are repetitive, this is a great time to use a while loop. Then during each game tick, we can simply generate three random ticks. And if we go into the function that shows what our random ticks do, we just see it picks a random coordinate from our list. And then based on the sugarcane mechanics that we discussed, it either ages the sugarcane, grows the sugarcane, or does nothing if there isn't sugarcane at that coordinate. Finally, we just harvest. This is basically resetting our coordinates and counting how many sugarcane blocks we just reset. Now the moment I'm sure you've all been waiting for, actually running the code to get some answers. Right away, we notice some interesting peaks in the efficiencies. If you watched the kelp video, this is what I was talking about. And these peaks make sense when we remember that sugarcane has to age a bunch before it actually grows. So at around 20 minutes, we have our first peak, and then we have another around 40 minutes. This corresponds with a roughly 18 minute average grow time. What we're seeing here is that if we just harvest after the sugarcane grows to stage two, or after it grows to both two and three, then we'll get better efficiency. If we harvest too early or too late, we're just wasting time. This pattern, of course, also presents itself in the sugarcane per hour per planted metric. And if you're still wondering what this graph is useful for, we can do a quick example. Let's say you have a flying machine, a sugarcane farm like this, and you've planted a thousand sugarcane. If you set your harvest interval time to 40 minutes, how many sugarcane should you expect to get after 10 hours? Well, just go to the graph and find the rate for a 40 minute harvest interval time. And we see it's about 2.6 sugarcane per hour per plant. So all we have to do is multiply that by 10 hours and the 1000 sugarcane you planted, and we get 26,000 sugarcane. Now that our middle school math problem is done, let's look at compactness. Obviously the more area efficient design wins here, but we still don't know which is better overall. This is where subjectiveness comes in. In my opinion, the effort required to plant the area efficient pattern far exceeds the slight improvement in compactness. So if I make a flying machine farm, I'm going to stick with the simple rows. What about clock timing? Again, this is subjective. Even though we have numbers showing that the fastest clock time is the most efficient, that's not realistic. And even if we chose the fastest time where the flying machine could actually harvest the entire length of the farm, maybe five minutes, is that better? Is the higher lag worth the higher efficiency? Maybe, but that's up to you. If you just want decent efficiency, I'd say based on this graph, go with a clock time of 40, 41, or 42 minutes. And to make the clock simple, you could just use some sort of daylight sensor setup because the Minecraft day-night cycle is conveniently 20 minutes. Well, let's put a pin in the flying machine farms for now and move on to the next ones. Here we've got two super basic, typical beginner sugarcane farms. The one on the left uses a clock to activate all the pistons at once while the one on the right uses observers to activate the pistons in smaller groups when the sugarcane actually grows to stage three. If you had to guess, which one would you say is more efficient? These two versions use water streams to both grow the sugarcane and carry drops to a collection area. So they have building simplicity and relatively minimal resources on their side. However, as I'll show here, this collection method can lead to significant loss, up to 50%. And because I wanna give each farm setup a fair shake, we're not gonna look at these two designs. Instead, we'll look at their lossless versions that have a more compact design overall and use minecart hoppers to collect the drops. Let's first take a look at the clock-based piston farm. The piston groupings don't really matter as every piston gets activated by the clock at the same time. So like the flying machine farms, 
we'll look at various harvest clock intervals over a 1000 hour test period. Now the exact code for growing and harvesting is different for each farm type, but because the basic steps are the same, I won't waste your time walking through each program. Instead, we can just skip to the fun part, graphs. Here we've got the efficiency and rate graphs together, and these should look very, very familiar. That's right, they're pretty much the same as the flying machine farms. Next, we can take a look at the compactness of this design. And obviously it's gonna be a lot bigger, but now we see by how much. So if you're wanting a large scale sugarcane farm with decent efficiency, a flying machine farm is much better than a clock-based piston farm in compactness, ease of building, and resource cost. But that's not to say this farm has no use. This design, because it can be scaled down very small, could make for a really good starter sugarcane farm. Moving on to the observer operated farm with piston groups. And in this most common design, the pistons are laid out in groups of eight. Because we're not testing various clock times for this farm, I decided to test various piston groupings over the 1000 hour testing span. Like I said, most common are eight pistons together, but I wanted to see if that was actually the best thing to do. To my surprise, unless you have groups of only one or two, the group size pretty much doesn't matter. You get a bit more than 75% efficiency for any grouping three or greater. What's even more surprising than that though, is that for the groups of three to 16, you're getting worse efficiency than a clock-based farm with just a 40 minute harvest interval. So this farm design is less efficient, more costly, and increases lag spikes because the piston groups fire more often. An interesting but not surprising part here is that with a single tile, we can reach almost 100% efficiency. If we did single tiles in this design, we would obviously need to double the space though. Too bad we can't make this more compact. Or can we? After that amazing segue, I introduced to you a very similar design to our previous farm. But if you look close, we changed how the observers activate the pistons. What this allows us to do is stack our pistons and observers right next to each other, just like the last farm. But instead of a group of pistons firing when one observer is triggered, these pistons are activated individually. I thought I came up with this design, but when I looked more into it, turns out it's pretty obvious and there's a bunch of slight variations on this concept. The earliest I can see this design being used is from 2020 by a YouTuber called Mikey Perion. And even earlier than that, I saw a Reddit post from eight years ago where I am an introvert shows an even simpler version where instead of note blocks, they just use redstone dust under the blocks like this and it works great and is actually cheaper than the version I'm using. So I'll put links in the description if you wanna check either of those out. But I'm sticking with note blocks here because you can stack these whole units back to back with no gap. So it makes it just a little more compact. And I'm assuming if you're gonna build a large version of this farm with this many pistons, you've probably got a good enough source of wood for the note blocks. Looking at the graphs for this farm, you'll see I wanted to test what the efficiency and rates look like for different run times. Cause in the previous farm design, we had the system run for a thousand hours and we got 99.99% .99 efficiency. And by doing so, we see that this farm with individually controlled pistons it's very efficient, very fast, hitting roughly 99.5% efficiency in the first 20 hours. And it just fluctuates around that 99.5 due to some randomness for the remaining run times. So it's not like you have to wait a long time for the effort you put into making this to actually pay off. Now, maybe that 99.5 or 99.9% .9 efficiency just isn't good enough for you. Well, I felt the same, so I made this 100% efficient farm. And yes, this farm is actually my own design, as far as I can tell, and it is perfectly efficient because I've got the observers and pistons at the same layer. So right when the sugar cane grows, it gets harvested. If there's some doubts, here's what the graphs look like for various run times tested, and I've made a separate video on this design if you wanna see how to build it in more detail. I designed this farm specifically to get that perfect efficiency because I thought it was neat. And I think if someone could take this idea and make it so the tiles can be stacked right next to each other, it could be great, but in reality, there are many downsides to this current design. First being the sheer size if you wanna scale it up. Additionally, redstone dust apparently does have some randomness, and since timing is so crucial to this design, that randomness can actually break one of these units. The solution is just to move the unit to a different location or close and reopen the game. I don't fully understand why this happens, but either way, this farm on a larger scale has some major reliability issues. So there we have it. A pretty comprehensive comparison, I think, of the most popular sugarcane farms and a couple others added in. Overall, determining which is the best is up to each player. But here's a recap of our general findings. While just about every farm could be the best for someone, the observer operated piston group farm is undoubtedly the worst. It's not any more compact than similar designs. It's on the expensive side. It's not very simple to build and it's the least efficient farm tested. If you want perfect efficiency, no matter the cost and up until the farm breaks, go with this design. If you want incredibly high efficiency 
and like reliability, and you don't mind increased resource cost or build difficulty or size, definitely go with the brown farm design, or at least a variation of it. If you want a simple starter shuriken farm and still want to get decent efficiency, you could go with a smaller version of this clock operated piston farm. And finally, for what most people probably want, if you're looking for a decently efficient farm, like 78% efficiency, that is pretty simple to build, relatively compact, and doesn't require too many resources, I'd go with this simple flying machine farm here with a harvest time of 40 to 42 minutes, depending on how simple you want the clock to be. All right, thank you for sticking around this long. I hope you found this video useful or at the very least interesting. If you have any feedback on the video or want to see other crops or farm designs tested, let me know in the comments. That's all I've got for you. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.